Okay, welcome back. Today is lecture five. We're going to talk about atoms and their structure, and this is part one of two. This is less the history of the atom itself and more a history of the concept of the atom. The original idea of the atom, remember, came from Democritus in 400 BC. Democritus was walking on a beach and looked at the sand. He noticed that when you cut the sand, you got smaller sand grains. So he began to wonder, what is the smallest possible piece you can get? And he dubbed that smallest piece atomos, which means uncuttable. Aristotle followed the idea of the four or five element concept of the world. Remember that he believed on, in earth, air, fire, water, and proposed a fifth element called ether. He felt that it was a blend of these four or five substances that made up all things. So who was right? Remember that the scientific method had not been invented yet, and the ancient Greeks did not perform experiments. Instead, they settled questions with debates. Aristotle was better at arguing his points, so he won, and his ideas carried on through the Middle Ages. So John Dalton arrives on the scene in the 1700s. He summarized the results of his experiments and those of others in the scientific fields that he dabbled in. He defined the elements in the modern sense of how we think of them. He stated that the elements are substances that cannot be broken down under normal means. In Dalton's atomic theory, he combined the idea of elements with those of the atom. He said that all matter is made of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms, and they are identical if they're from the same element. But those atoms of different elements are different. Atoms can combine in whole number ratios to form compounds, and chemical reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms because no new atoms are created or destroyed. Dalton's atomic theory led directly to the law of definite proportions. It states that each compound has a specific ratio of elements, and it is a ratio by mass. In this example, water is always 8 grams of oxygen for every gram of hydrogen. If you look at your periodic table, you'll see that oxygen weighs about 16 atomic mass units, and hydrogen weighs one atomic mass unit each, so we can arrive at the formula H2O that way. J.J. Thompson was an English physicist in 1897. He made a piece of equipment called a cathode ray tube. It's a vacuum tube where all the air had been pumped out and a limited number of other gases had been pumped in. These used to be in televisions and in computer monitors, for example. CRTs work by passing an electric current through it. This makes a beam appear to move from the negative to the positive end. By adding the electric field, he found that the moving pieces were negatively charged. In his experiments, Thompson used many different combinations of metals and gases. The beam produced, however, was always the same. By the amount of be the beam bent, he could find the ratio of the charge to the mass. It was the same with every material because he concluded that there was the same type of piece in every kind of atom making this behavior. This piece was found to be the electron. We couldn't find the positive charge, which we now know as the proton, for a while. So we said that the atom was arranged like a plum pudding. It had a bunch of positive stuff with the electrons dispersed throughout that could be removed. To find the mass of an electron, he needed to measure the charge. Millikan's apparatus atomized oil droplets and inserted it into the top chamber. X-rays give some drops a charge by knocking off their electrons. Then an electron charge is charged on the plates and causes some of the drops to hover. From the mass of the drop and the charge on the plates, he calculated the mass of the electron, because he knew the mass and the volume of the oil drop. The charge was calculated from the difference in the charge on the mass and the charge on the plates. These guys were way smarter than I was. I could never have thought that one up. Ernest Rutherford was a New Zealand physicist. He believed Thomson's plum pudding model was correct, but he devised an experiment to see how big the electrons that are spaced around in the positive matrix actually were. He used radioactive alpha particles, which are positively charged pieces given off by uranium, and then shot at them. Um, they shot at a sheet of gold foil that was only a few atoms thick. There was a detecting screen that would fluoresce when the alpha particles hit it. 
He expected that the alpha particles would pass through in a straight line without changing direction very much because the positive charges should be spread out evenly. Alone, he didn't expect them to stop the alpha particles. However, what he got was this. He explained this by saying that the atom is actually mostly empty space instead of an evenly distributed plum pudding of positive charges. He calculated that there was a small, dense, positively charged piece at the center that will deflect positively charged alpha particles if they get close enough. So as a result of the works mentioned previously and those of other contributors, we know that the electrons exist in a cloud of around a much smaller central nucleus, composed of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons. The cloud is a region where you may find an electron and exists as a probability space that is more than actual discrete regions. However, we will refer to the electron orbitals, or shells, to make it easier for you to visualize electrons that will be chemically reactive and those that will not. Experimental data shows that the protons and neutrons weigh almost exactly the same. Both are about 1,840 times the mass of an electron. So almost all of the mass of the atom rests in the center or nucleus, where the protons and neutrons reside. So a quick brief overview. You have this in your notes, so I'm not going to read it out to you. But you do need to know the symbols, charges, and the relative masses. Okay. Okay, so the atomic number is the same as the number of protons in an atom. The number of protons determines the kind of atom we're talking about. In a neutral atom, the number of protons will equal the number of electrons. The mass number is made up of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. However, Dalton was wrong on the concept of isotopes. Atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons, which results in different mass numbers. These are called isotopes. The symbols for elements contain the symbol of the element, the mass number, and the atomic number. When naming isotopes, you put the mass number after the name of the element, such as carbon-14 in this picture. So we're going to practice now. I want you to find the number of protons, neutrons, electrons, atomic number, mass number, and the name. You'll need to use your periodic table for this, and I'm going to help you with this one, and then you're going to do the next one on your own. So the number of protons is the lower number. That's 11. That's also the atomic number. The number of neutrons is the mass number, which is the top, minus the number of protons. So 23 minus 11 is 12. The number of electrons, because this is a neutral atom, is the same as the number of protons. So there are 11 electrons. The atomic number is 11, as I've said. The mass number is 23, as I've said. And the name of this is sodium, and that's the one that you need to look up. So here's yours. I want you to pause and practice this. And remember that when we're talking about mass numbers, we're talking about whole numbers. When we talk about number of neutrons, we're talking about whole numbers. So make sure that you uh, round Okay, write down your answers. If you need some clarification on it, please feel free to call me or email me or see me during office hours, and I'll be happy to help you. Let's look at it in a different way. If an element has an atomic number of 34 and a mass number of 78, what is the number of protons? Well, the number of protons will be 34 because that's the atomic number. The number of neutrons would be the mass minus the atomic number, so that's 78 minus 34, which gives us 44. The number of electrons in a neutral element is the same as the number of protons, so that's 34. The complete symbol would be Se with a number above it at 78 and a number below it at 34, and the name would be selenium. Okay, so this is your turn. You're going to pause the lecture, and actually we're going to end it, and um, we'll come back to this lecture in a minute. But we're going to end this with this one. I want you to practice this, and again, you can check with me on office hours, email, or by phone. Thanks. Back in a minute.